Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another edition of a podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a Beatles show that focuses mainly on what's happening in the world of the Beatles, news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, known for the Beatles show Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by a couple of people here on uh, this particular broadcast. First of all, my co-host, who writes for Beatles Examiner and millions of other Examiner columns, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. And we also have on the line with us Dave Humphreys, who is a musician who lives in San Diego, who actually comes from England. And um, he struck up a friendship with the man that we're going to focus this show on, and that is Tony Sheridan. And uh, as we're recording this show on February 20th, Tony passed away on the 16th. And Dave was a good friend of Tony's. In fact, Dave and his wife, Robbie, uh, put together a Beatle convention, San Diego Beatle Fair, that happened a few months ago, and Tony was a guest there, and in fact it was his last public performance. So, welcome to the show, Dave Humphreys. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. Let's talk a little bit about how important Tony Sheridan is to the history of the Beatles, because we all know that the very first commercial releases from the Beatles were the songs that they recorded with Tony, and at the same time there were the other two songs, Ain't She Sweet, that John sang lead vocals on, and the instrumental Cry for a Shadow, plus a number of other songs with Tony on lead vocals. And I think uh, we should talk about those recordings, how important they are, and also uh, provide for our listeners who may not know a little bit of a background on Tony Sheridan. Would you like to help out there, Steve? I was looking through some... some um uh, background on Tony, and it was actually interesting that because uh, the Beatles recorded with uh, for Burt Kemford in Hamburg, and Kemford actually preferred Tony over the Beatles, and he was he was uh, uh, he wanted to release them, and he said it was obvious to me that they were enormously talented, but nobody, including the boys themselves, knew how to use their, that talent or where it would lead them. And I'd like to ask Dave, Dave, put a little perspective on Tony's. Uh, role with the Beatles when they when they first met. Tony was actually a star, was he not? He was, yes. He uh, made a name for himself, or a little bit of a name for himself in uh, in Britain uh, with the old boy show and stuff when he was on tour with the likes of Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran. So when they got to Hamburg, it was like he was the star, you know. And... Um, you often heard things mentioned where uh, some of the Beatles would refer to Tony as the teacher. Mm-hmm. And, of course, lots of that came from things they got from his shows. Mm-hmm. Like, for, for instance, um, the way John held his guitar high on his chest. I think Jerry Marsden got the same idea. But also... On a more technical side, there were lots and lots of chords that uh, Tony would use, you know, seventh and ninth and sixth all over the place. And, you know, so interesting when after I'd met Tony and I'd seen him play close up and then you'd put on a Beatles record and then you would hear this particular chord that you'd just seen him play. And you'd go, wow, you know, that's... <laughs> An, an enormous uh, influence on on the guys in Germany. Yeah, for the people listening that may not know, Oh Boy was a very popular program in England, and um, Tony was a regular on the show. He played guitar and sang, and as he told me, because we're going to play a little bit of an interview that I did with him, which dates back to 1992, he was the first guy to play electric lead guitar on a British TV show. That's right. And- and it also should be mentioned that that show was produced by Jack Good, who later produced the ABC show Shindig here in America. That's right. Yeah. When you were with uh, Tony, did he ever talk about the Beatle days with you, Dave? Well, he would sometimes touch on it, you know, but I would deliberately stay off the subject, if you know what I mean, because he would get that night and day sure. of uh, fans. Actually, when I first uh, got to meet Tony, which was 1999, 
when he came across for his first uh, Beetle Fair here in San Diego, we just got a call out of the blue from our um, fan club chairman, and she said, uh, would you mind if Tony Sheridan stayed at your house? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, wow. So I come home from work, and there's Tony Sheridan in my house, sitting in my chair, drinking my beer. <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't believe this, you know. But we ended up just sitting on the balcony outside and we connected and it it wasn't a musical thing. It was, we were talking about school days in England, you know. Hmm. I mean, there's like a 11-year, 12-year difference between us, but nothing much had changed at school, you know, where we were getting the cane and stuff like that, so... <laughs> So I take it the, the fact that you were British helped helped uh, bond you two together. Is that? Is I that... think so. And there was, you know, he was always ribbing me that I was a northerner. You know, <laughs> 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 he would say things like, "Do you think he could take me and stuff like that?" <laughs> you know? Wow. <laughs> Where exactly do you come from, Dave? For the folks who want to know, uh, what Durham part of England? City. What was that? Durham City. It's about twelve miles south. Of Newcastle, okay, which was famous for the animals, amongst other things. Oh yeah. And were you a regular uh, viewer or watcher of Oh Boy? Were you familiar with Tony's oh, work? Oh no, I was a bit young for that. <laughs> uh huh. But I mean, I've seen videos of it since. I can remember some things, but I can't remember seeing Tony on there. My first exposure to Tony, apart from the obvious hearing uh, My Bunny after the Beatles had made it big, was when an album called The Beatles First was issued, which I think was 67 when it first came out with all of the other songs on. And of course, that's the same time Pepper came out. Mm. So he listened to Sergeant Pepper and because I'd got this paper round, I could afford to buy another album, and I saw this one. Hmm. So I invested in it, and I'm putting that on, and I'm thinking, well, my bunny's like, uh. but then I heard Ruby Baby, and I'm going, wow, who's this guy, you know? Sitting yeah. in my bedroom, listening to Tony Sheridan, and then all those years later, he's sitting in my front room. You know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's got to be some some experience right there. Mm. When you listen to those recordings now, and you too, Steve, what do you think about when you hear those early recordings with Tony Sheridan? I've always liked those recordings, uh, I have to say. Um, my Bonnie especially, because it was just so different. It was so unexpected to hear the Beatles do a song like that. And Ain't She Sweet was just wonderful. I mean, that was just a fan. I remember hearing that a lot in the 60s because mm -hmm. obviously because it was them and i mean that was a great version of of uh of that song that uh, that john sang it's too bad that that uh, kemford didn't record more with just them too but i mean uh and and it's actually surprising i had dug up a um a video of tony singing my bonnie the other night and i forget what year it was from but he did the the guitar in there and and you know i think a lot of people um don't really know how much of a contribution he made to those songs. It wasn't just him singing with the Beatles. He was playing on those on those songs, too. Is that, is well, that the, right? Uh, the lead guitar solo in, in My Bonnie comes from mm -hmm. Tony. Right. Yes. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of people think it's just all Beatles and Tony, but it's not. It's not just, it's not all the Beatles... The Beatles aren't doing; are the only ones playing in there. Tony was was part of the group at that, you know, on those recordings. Yeah, that needs to be mentioned. Tony was um, a talent in his own right, and you're talking about uh, Oh Boy and stuff. And but um, yeah, Tony was uh, again. Tony was the star when uh, the Beatles met when the Beatles met him. And Dave, your mention of the teacher—that's the exact words that that Pete Best used. In uh -huh. his uh, statement about uh, about Tony after his passing, which uh, which he brought that back up, you know, mm -hmm. the teacher. 
Well, there was a quote from George as well from a few years ago where George had said, everything I know about rock and roll is down to Tony Sheridan. Mm. Well, I'd and like to see that he quote. He such yeah. a fantastic guitar player. Um, wow. You know, and even then, you know, I mean, everybody knew he was now, but even as so young, he was such a terrific and innovative guitarist, you know? Besides besides what he, I mean, obviously, when he was at Beetle Fair, he would do My Bonnie, but what other kinds of stuff would he do just left to his own? What If he was going to play, play, just play? Well, would he would do... do um, Bright Lights, Big City, Fever. He, he used to always do What Did I Say, mm-hmm. which, you know, in the Hamburg days would last an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, things like that. And, he, and then he would have his slower moments where he would do his version of Yesterday. Mm. And You've Got a Friend. Yes. James <laughs> Taylor's song, which when he did it, uh, at the Beatle Fair here, he had everybody singing along with him. It was a wonderful moment, you know. <laughs> um, he was he was very free for him in concert. You kind of didn't know what to expect. He could pretty much do whatever he felt like. Uh huh. And that's that's really the way he was. And and uh, you just reminded me because when I interviewed Tony in 1992, I had said to him that I was so impressed with his song selection because it was so eclectic and James Taylor was one of the artists that he did perform and I I didn't remember that until I listened back to the interview but uh, you know one thing that I do recall uh, and this is from uh, Spencer Lee's book The Beatles in Hamburg was that he said that um, Tony was known for really he loved to perform I mean that was his calling he loved to be up on stage most of all and he loved to play for long periods of time and the whole idea of groups like the Beatles doing long nights in Hamburg and playing for eight hours, granted with some breaks in between, that really came from Tony. That he kind of made that sort of, uh, you know, the, what artists did back then, rock bands mm-hmm. did, to play long, long periods of time on stage. And that's right. how they all got better and honed their craft. In right. fact, that there was yeah. a story in there about some guy that went to see Tony in a club, and he was doing a particular song, and he left the club, this guy did, came back a half hour later, and Tony was still playing the same song. <laughs> so he was known for doing that. He loved to jam a lot. So, And you probably know that better than most of us, Dave. Well, we never, we never used to get a, a list of songs before we went on with him. <laughs> yeah. So it was like flying by the seat of your pants. And you're kind of winging it. <laughs> and he, he would sometimes change the key, too, so... <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, yeah. It keeps you on your toes, but uh, I'm just pleased I wasn't a drummer. Because <laughs> <laughs> he always had this thing about drummers, you know, he'd, <laughs> he'd give them hell. <laughs> give them dirty looks. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. If a drummer was playing what he thought should be there, Tony would sometimes stop and correct him, you know? Hmm. Wow. In front of the crowd? In front of the crowd, yes. (laughs) (laughs) When I listen back to these uh, recordings that Tony made with the Beatles, for one thing, I'm I'm very impressed, because first of all, with the exception of Ain't She Sweet and Cry for a Shadow, you've got the Beatles acting as a backing band in a way, for somebody. So it's a different role to play. But at the same time, I love the fact that uh, these are recordings with Pete Best. So if you want to get some kind of representation of what Pete was like in the group, performing with them, this is a good example of that. And I also right. think that the, the actual production is really strong for these recordings. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I can't believe how bright it sounds when I listen back to it now. Yeah. I like the fact on the fact on the uh, Time Life uh, release that they separated the stereo and the mono, which I think that's the first time that's been done, and um, so that was that was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The Bear Family did the um, mono and stereo ones as well, Steve. I did, think. They, did they? Uh, Beetle Bop, I think the CD was right. called. Right. Right. 
I thought uh, I don't have that sitting in front of me. I thought when um, the time life thing came out, I did a little comparison and they were all mixed together. But I don't, I don't like I said, I don't have it. I have it in the other room. I didn't, okay. I didn't bring it out here with me. But still, I mean, that was great. That was a great. Uh, it's a great set, and it's nice that it's too bad it didn't win the Grammy. That's uh, that was a shame. Um, That's right. Yeah, the booklet um, has some nice surprises in there because yeah, you can actually does. see um, some mini bios that each of the Beatles wrote for themselves at the mm-hmm. time uh, when they had to sign their contract. And it's just kind of interesting. It's, it, it tells you a little bit about their personalities, gives you a little bit of insight. Because if you look, John said at the bottom of his page, wrote a couple of songs with Paul. You look at what Paul wrote at the bottom of the page, he wrote... Wrote about seventy songs with John, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, John also said for his ambition to be rich. <laughs> so I love looking at that stuff. But um, you know these recordings that that uh, Tony made with the Beatles is also a good example of how musically eclectic he was. Because um, listening back to my interview with Tony, um, he said that the song "Nobody's Child" was one that he himself picked. He wouldn't have wanted to go for something more familiar like My Bonnie. That wasn't really in his taste. That was something that, that Bert Camfort and actually his wife, I think, suggested that they because record. the kids learned that at school, evidently, uh, to learn English. Oh, wow. Hmm. So they would all know the words. Oh, hmm. that's interesting. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, those recordings are really, are really special, and um, especially, uh, hopefully now... They'll get, you know, they'll get a little more attention. I mean, while well, they've been reissued so often and everybody's kind of used to them, but uh, I think they'll they'll get a little more significance now. I hope uh, mm-hmm. that they deserve. You know, sometimes, and it's something that that bothers me over time. That a lot of young people who are discovering the Beatles, and I'm I'm so grateful that they do. They don't really study the history. And a lot of people aren't aware that if it wasn't for a record like My Bonnie, which was brought to the attention of Brian Epstein, then maybe Brian would not have pursued going to the cavern and then later right, becoming right. the manager for the Beatles. Right. So, right. you know, it started with that, and it's important to, to remember that. Yeah, and and um, one thing I, w- I also dug up, I, I was looking through Spencer's book, too, and he mentioned that... Um, that uh, the Beatles backed Tony during his uh, year-long residency at the Top Ten Club in 1961, and he said it's a shame no one uh, uh, recorded any of those those uh, gigs. Mm. And boy, that would have been that would have been awesome uh, if uh, if, would you not? If, uh, if those had been recorded. Well, from what I you know, what I've heard Tony say is that the Beatles backed him up, and at the same time, he backed them up. Mm-hmm. You know, it was uh, kind of interchangeable. Right, I'm I'm all for, and I think I've mentioned this on the show before, that they should that they should reissue the Star Club stuff. I don't really think I think that you know all the stuff that came out in court about it is irrelevant. I mean, those are historical recordings, and they need to be out. And why they and it's I think it's crazy that they aren't. But that's true. You know, it's really fascinating to listen to now because you've heard so much about what a great band the Beatles were in Hamburg. And no, it's not a great recording, but you can certainly hear enough to get the mm-hmm. gist of what the Beatles sounded like on stage, especially the guitar playing. And I think they could probably they could probably remaster it and fix them up. Maybe not make them perfect, but they could they could do some you know technical stuff with those things and and make them sound a little better than than they did. Yeah, I thought so. why don't we play just um, one clip of the interview that I did with Tony. And I must say that uh, looking back now, I just feel so honored to have done this interview. And uh, after Tony passed away, I listened to this interview for the first time probably since then. And I was surprised at how much we covered. And uh, so I thought what I would play is just uh, Tony remembering what it was like the first time that uh, he saw the Beatles and also what he thought of Burt Camfort in his role as producer on those recordings. All right, so let's listen to a clip of my interview with Tony. Do you recall the first time that you met the Beatles and what was your initial impression of them? Yes, I do. I was playing in the club, in a strip club actually, because I was playing in between the, the strip numbers. You know, just to 
break it up a bit. And that was my job. So they came in one night, cow cowboy boots, jeans, leather jackets, you know, with the Elvis hairstyles. And, and it was quite normal for musicians uh, to, to visit each other, so I didn't think much of it at the time. I was quite impressed by the, 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 the sort of uh, attitude they had, very cheeky, you know, arrogant thing going. Definitely was, you know. But I knew it was all show. But uh, um, we used to go and visit, see each other, and play with each other. You know, this, this is how we eventually came to play together and do these recordings together. We, we'd seen each other earlier and and played together, but just sort of bumming around. And uh, the, there were places in uh, Hamburg where we used to go after the show and sit there till five or six in the morning and carry on playing. And that was the important time, really, because that was uh, when the creativity really started. We got out of these. Uh, set ways of playing and develop new sort of ideas of things. What was it like for you to record with the Beatles with Bert Camford as a producer? We know that he used to record with his own band a lot of instrumentals and uh, he's known for having co-written songs like Strangers in the Night. He's not really known for having a reputation for working with rock musicians. What was it like for you to work with someone who really didn't have the experience to work with the format of a rock and roll group? Well, spontaneously, I, I would say that it was it was uh, an advantageous to be left alone in, in the sense that he didn't mess with our music. Uh, and his own music was so far away from what we, we were doing, there was no chance of him influencing us with his stuff. You know, we weren't interest, interested. Uh, it, it, his wife was very influential in persuading him to take songs uh, that had been hits already in the States, for instance, and for us to do them, you know, so like things like Ruby Baby and D Let's Dance and things like that. No, I did, you know, stupid, but I did them. Uh, that was as far as his influence uh, really extended after the initial recordings was he, he used to come up with these tunes and say, what do you think of this one? And in that way, he was sort of pushing us into, a, or pushing me into a, a, a certain bag. I didn't realize it at the time, you know. But it was preferable to, to singing uh, the other alternative in Germany, which would have been in German, Schlager, you know, just sentimental sort of pop songs. I even did try that for one or two records and forgot it very quickly. But his influence uh, on, the, on them, I, I'd say he was just a catalyst, like uh, any number of other people involved in that situation, in the whole scene at that time, like Astrid Kirchner, or Klaus Foreman, you know, they were also very influential in their way. It's very hard to pinpoint how exactly they influenced them, but they did, you know, everybody knows that they did. And he didn't influence them through his music or through his personality, but he was de definitely, uh, he provided the, the, the possibility of going into the studio and, and doing this, uh, my Bonnie thing, which obviously helped them to make a jump somewhere else later on. You know, he was just there at the right time. And that's it. A little bit of my interview with uh, Tony wow. Sheridan right there. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, and you're going to play the rest of that on the show tonight and oh, then no, put it on your website? It's going to be on my show next week, which will be on uh, the 27th. Okay. Because actually tonight I'm doing a George Harrison birthday special. But uh, most of my interview will be on the 27th. But uh, most of the interview will also be posted on my website, which okay. is KenMichaelsRadio.com. That's fantastic. That th Those comments there were just wonderful. That was fantastic. Yeah. It's nice to just uh, talk about Burke Camfort and what his influence was. I just like what he had to say about him, you know, not really interfering so much in the recordings. Mm -hmm. He made some suggestions, but, you know, he kind of left the band to their own devices. They kind of knew what they were doing. Anyway, they knew the arrangements of their songs. Well, he's, I mean, he knew they were talented. He knew the Beatles were talented. That kind of goes along with that. That's fantastic, though. Congratulations on that one, Ken. That's, that's great. Dave, how how was his how was his appearance in San Diego in uh, it was in October, correct? Uh, October twenty uh, seventh. Okay. Like I say he got here um, on the twenty fifth, and then the twenty sixth he did like a, a meet and greet at a little ice cream shop we have here, and um, uh, he wasn't very well there, and actually at the show he he wasn't very well and just did. Maybe like four, four numbers, and then you know we had to get him off stage. He, he couldn't do any more. 
And so, um, you know, we were trying to take care of him as best we could for the rest of his stay. And then we put him on the aircraft. And then we heard the day after that he'd been uh, taken to hospital in Germany. Oh, man. Yeah. And not long after that, he, he went into a coma, correct? Yes, yes, we'd heard that too, yes. That, but that was medically induced. Right, hmm. right, then, yeah. Uh, do you remember what the uh, the four songs were that he performed? So yep. we know the last songs he ever performed yes. live? interestingly enough, he opened up with Fever. <laughs> 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 Fever, um, What Did I Say, Bright Lights, Big City, and You've Got a Friend, and then he sat down, and I, I just wanted to close things out with the audience, because they'd heard he was ill, you know, so they were they were with him. So <laughs> I explained to them that Tony couldn't carry on, and we just did the my tune, that music in a friend's house, which Tony actually plays in. And he sat on the bench, the piano bench, and played the guitar on that. Mm. And then and then we had to take him home. Okay. But, you know, I mean, the audience were delighted that Tony made the effort. He was like a trooper, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, you, you know, you don't need me to tell you that. No. Right. No. Now, you've worked with Tony in the studio on your own albums. He's helped uh -huh. you out. What was that like? It's, I had to keep pinching myself. <laughs> you know, as he's thinking, this is, <laughs> this is Tony Sheridan. And he's he's playing on on my tunes. <laughs> it was terrific. Did he add a lot of ideas for your songs? Uh huh. There was one in particular, a Thirty Eight Days song, and the little melody that goes through all the way with the guitar is uh, Tony's idea. It's just beautiful, uh -huh. you know. And he would <laughs> say, "Just change that chord there." Or this chord here, you know, little suggestions like that, or change that line in the song to this, you know. Hmm. So it was like contribution, and actually this time he was here in October, he wanted us to do some more music, but of okay. course that was the main reason he was coming over. Hmm. And But, you know, but because he was so ill... We couldn't do anything. Uh, That's very sad. How many of your albums did he appear on? Uh, two, one, one EP called 38 Days and another one called And So It Goes. Okay. He plays on five tracks. Was there ever any talk of you writing anything with him? Yes, that's what he wanted to do this time he was here. Oh, mm. what a shame. But of course, of course it didn't happen. Another thing I'd like to mention is that it it seems that Tony was never the same after Anna died. You know, his wife died mm -hmm. in 2011. And, you know, he was that devastated, Tony. Right. Uh, I had right. heard about that from the quote in uh -huh. your article there, Steve, from Mark Lewison. Right. That it kind of, uh, you know, took the life out of him. He was never the same after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What kind of a of a person was he just to hang out with as a friend, Dave? He was he was great, just full of fun, you know. And he, he'd occasionally, uh, if you said something, he could <laughs> he could pull you up on it, or he'd sometimes do this confrontational thing, you know. <laughs> but a lot of that was humour. Uh huh. I think a lot of people were upset by Tony. But they didn't get that. A lot of it was his humor. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, I introduced uh, one of the guys here as the best sound man in San Diego. And Tony said, well, they all say that, you know. And, of course, the guy got himself upset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just a question of getting used to that sense of humor. It's the same thing with the Beatles. You know, and there's there's that ah. uh, that Liverpool thing of of putting you down, but right. when they don't really mean it, 
You know, it's just right. It's just uh, yep. you know, you just have to be used to that kind of thing. Yeah, R- Ringo does a lot of that now. Um, That's right. And um, and sometimes his comments get misinterpreted. And, That's right. That's and, and taken, right. And taken, you know, taken a lot more harshly than they're meant. That's right. Do you think yeah. this is just uh, you know on a professional level here, Dave? Um, uh-huh. That uh, Tony was overall just extremely proud of his history with the Beatles or did it kind of annoy him that that's what he's so best known for and that despite all of the music that he's made and he's recorded several albums that he was constantly performing you know he may be known always as more of a footnote in Beatle history well I know he was proud of it but it was like a bit of both actually you know he would get chased off thinking, you know, he needs to be recognized more than just being a footnote in the Beatles story. Hmm. But, you know, apart from that, one of his biggest things that he was proud of was when he went to Vietnam Okay. and played for the American troops. He was oh. always wanting to, to give something back to America. Oh, wow. For what, what year? America had given him. What year was that? Oh, in 67 when he went to Vietnam. Oh, wow. And I, I can actually remember as a, as a teenager reading that Tony had been killed. Oh, really? In the New Musical Express mm-hmm. or something, but it was it was a mistake. But it, one, it was one of his other band members who was actually killed. But Tony was really proud of that. He was made an um, honorary captain. Hmm. the U.S. Army, and in fact, the first time Tony came here, me and my wife, Robbie, had to take him down to the veterans store, the Army-Navy thing, and Tony wanted to collect all of the badges and caps that he'd <laughs> lost over all the moves he'd had. Oh, wow. And so he, he was like a like a young kid in a sweet shop. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's fantastic. But that, he was really proud of that. And if anybody, any listener here gets the chance to hear his Vagabond CD, that beautiful track called Indochina, Indochina, sorry, is all about that um, time. Hmm. Okay. It's really nice to know that that was such a special thing for him to do and, and how much he re- was really proud of that. Yeah, it's a great story, Dave. Oh, did, thank you. Did he let you know of all of his own music what he was most proud of as far as albums are concerned? Did um, he ever talk about that with you? He was proud of the songs on Vagabond. He wasn't that sure about the production. But I think it's great, the production, but uh, he he said I could do better than that. But I suppose every musician has that opinion after things get finished. But the other album he was really proud of uh, is the one called Dawn Colors, okay. which was recorded in uh, Italy in 87. Um, and that one features Albert Lee. Hmm. And it's absolutely knockout. But I, I, In fact, I remember at one time Tony was coming out here, Wolfgang and I got the guys together and we rehearsed about four of the best tracks off that one, hoping that Tony would do some of these when he came over and do them live with us. Mm-hmm. But uh, he wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted his uh, he wanted his rock and roll and the blues and stuff. Mm-hmm. But if, if anybody any listener gets the chance, check out that album too, Dawn so- Colors. Dawn okay. Colors and Vagabond. Those uh-huh. would be the two that you'd you'd uh, you'd say he was the most proud of. Yep. So we should check those out. Definitely. Definitely. Anything else you'd like to to say about Tony as we close the show, Dave? Something maybe about him as a person that people may not know about that you know. Well, he once told me I didn't have a clue how to make tea. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know how to make tea? Yes. <laughs> Did your mother never teach you how to make a proper cup of tea? <laughs> mm. 
I think he was just a great guy to be to be with. And we, you know, my wife took him down to TJ. Sorry, Tijuana for listeners who don't know. <laughs> they had a wheel of a time down there. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, he loved it. Down. Well, I suppose it reminded him of the Reaper Barn, mm-hmm. which was another story when Tony and his wife Anna invited Robbie and I to Germany, and we stayed with them in the little village they lived in for a few days. And it took us around here, there, and everywhere. But, you know, the one night I looked forward to was the Reaper Barn. And who better to show you around there right. than, than Tony? You guys went to the Star Club, too, didn't you? Well, it's not there anymore. There's just that... Uh, the plaque. That plaque thing. Uh uh-huh, that It mm-hmm. burnt down. But that's... Yeah, we were there. Hmm. And he well, he was because I spotted Jimi Hendrix written on there, and uh, he said that was only put on there because the guy who made the plaque liked Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like touring the Kaiser uh, the uh, Reaper Barn with him? It was fantastic because he 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 took us. You you remember the stories when Tony supposed to took the Beatles into this store to buy the leather pants and the cowboy boots and stuff. Mm-hmm. He took us in that store. Mm-hmm. He took us in uh, this other music store where they actually bought, John would have bought the Rickenbacker and Paul the Hofner bass. He showed us the jail Pete and Paul was thrown in. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh-huh. The, what used to be the top ten club. He showed us exactly where they used to go in and up all of these stairs. The little bar, Gretel and Alphonse, which is uh, on the other side of the street from the Kaiser Keller, where all the bands used to go and have a drink in between. Um, you know, wow. and, and the Indra. Yeah. So it was, it was, you know, he didn't leave anything out. Even that little... Um, the, the little church that's at the end of the uh, Gross Fry Height, mm-hmm. where John allegedly had a leak, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, a little uh, recording thing not far from the railway station where I think the first time the Beatles had Ringo with them to do a tune called Summertime. Mm-hmm. And something else with a, uh, with another two guys from um, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. Rory Storm, yes, that's right, Ken. Wow, wasn't Gross Freiheit where they did My Bonnie, or am I um, um, am I confusing the? No, that was at uh, that was at a school hall somewhere away from the uh, Reaper Barn. Oh, here it is, Fre- Frederick Ebert Hall. That's right. Uh, we didn't go there. Okay. But he, he did. He did send me down uh, Albertstrasse, which, which is uh, it's all boarded off, you know, and only men can go in. <laughs> so he told me to walk down there and back again and see what I thought. So of course you're going down there and all the ladies are waving at you, but they don't. <laughs> have to <walk> down. <laughs> oh, cool! That's oh, yes. That's great. <laughs> well, you had to get the same the, experience that the Beatles did. Oh. <laughs> it's really oh. wonderful. It's it's wonderful that some of these places still exist today. That's right. And, and to get a tour from Tony, it's like, you know, <laughs> the tour of a lifetime. There's, there's, well, there's nothing better, is there? Yeah. No. And he would be telling you how, how when he first arrived in his van... Uh, with his band, the Jets, mm. how they were just pulled out the van and pushed down the stairs and virtually straight onto the stage mm. to play by, uh, I think that would be Bruno Koschmeider. Right. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, you know, he'd tell you about all the gangsters and stuff that was going on there, but how they were pretty much protected by Horst Fascher. Mm-hmm. Nobody messed with them. 
Right. Well, I bet a lot of listeners are envious of you that you got that tour. Hey, but the specialist thing, if that's a proper word, is to get up in the morning in Seastemuir and have Tony Sheridan cook you breakfast. <laughs> How about that? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Was he a good cook? Uh, oh, he was great. Bacon and eggs. Wonderful. <laughs> Bacon, eggs, fried tomato. Or tomato. All right, well, we have to, to end this show, unfortunately. But uh, I want to thank you, Dave, for joining us and sharing your memories of Tony well, Sheridan. Thank you for having me. This has been wonderful, Dave. Uh, uh, really wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I just wish you could have made it down, Steve, to that last Beatles fair thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry I didn't. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm kicking myself, I'll tell you, for not mm. coming down. But uh. well, We'll have to hook up again sometime soon. Okay. Um, yeah, except, not, uh, I don't know, maybe Paul McCartney will uh, show up at the Hollywood Bowl again. That's right. <laughs> that's where, that's where uh, Dave and I saw each other last time when uh, when Paul played the Hollywood Bowl. Oh. That's right, in the middle of, what, 20,000 something? Yeah, we were walking out. We were walking out of the Hollywood Bowl, and there, and there were, it was cold. Was, I remember that night. It was freezing. Uh-huh. It, was, it was, well, it was the end of March. It was very cold that night, and... Uh, that was, uh, but that, that was a heck of a show. That was a. Uh, oh, it was great. It was an amazing show. Yeah, amazing well. show. <laughs> Hopefully, he'll be playing in that area again, and uh, you guys invite me down. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, anyway. So thanks so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels, being joined by Steve Marinucci. If you need to get in touch with us, there's a number of ways you can do so. We have our own Facebook page at Things We Said Today. You can also email us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. It's rather lengthy, but it's worth it, I tell you, because uh, we read all of our emails. We appreciate all the support that we get for this show. And uh, also, if you want to get in touch with Steve, one other way you can do so is by. You can email me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com, or you can click on my Facebook page uh, with my name and uh, comment uh, to me there. I'm there a lot. I also have a Twitter account with my name on it. You can also send me a message there. Um, and I will I will respond because I'm, I'm very good at responding to anybody that uh, has a comment about the show. In fact, I did get a couple of comments, I think, this week. Somebody was asking me if the, uh, the Joe Smith interviews were available online, and I told them they were. So that's that's good news. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, uh, feel free to get a hold of me. And uh, again, thank you, Dave Humphreys. This has been uh, really a pleasure, really a pleasure. Hey, My Dave, pleasure. It, it, if yeah. people want to check out your CDs, is there a way online they can order it? Uh, yeah, it's available um, on iTunes and CD Baby, and they can listen to the songs on... Uh, they have Humphreys Music on Facebook, so they okay. could listen and see if they, if they like them enough to buy them. Okay. Okay. And check them out, too. And if you want to, you can always get in touch with me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net, and you can also check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Lots of interviews with people connected in the Beatle world, including, very soon, probably by the time this airs, my interview with Tony Sheridan. And uh, lots of trivia also posted every single week with lots of great prizes, too, to go along with them. So for Things We Said Today, I'm Ken Michaels, along with Steve Marinucci and Dave Humphreys, saying thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, guys.